Hello everyone. Welcome to the FPGA stand-up for 29th of March 2022 from Open Research Institute. Today we'll talk about what we've done over the past week, what we're going to be doing over the next week, uh, if we have any resources that we need, and if we have any roadblocks in our way. So we'll start with uh, Paul. Tell us uh, what's going on. Hello. Um, nothing. I haven't done anything to the remote lab over the last week. I think it's still working and uh, don't have any blocks. There are other things going on that are not related, but uh, nothing here in the, in the subject matter of FPGAs. Oh, good. Okay. So I think that that's probably good news. Uh, if you don't have much to report from remote labs, don't have to reconfigure anything or make anything work, um, then I think that's probably good news. Is that your feeling as well? That was my goal for the week and we've achieved it. All right, good. <laughs> a week with no news for the uh, remote lab. Very good, okay. As far as yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, hopefully we'll hear if there's anybody that needs anything. Uh, we do have a note from, um, from Jeff McBride. He says, just a quick hello. I couldn't make this one, but please keep the invites coming and we will. All right, so it's uh, the floor is now yours, Everest. Is it better? Yeah. Yes, yes, perfect. Uh, so last week, uh, we tried to debug the FPGA in color. Uh, Andre, well, we, we have seen that there, uh, there are some difference between the uh, the simulation and the output of the Pluto, then uh, we can see that on the simulation uh, compared to uh, compared to uh, the new radio block that Andre used, it's not exactly the same. Uh, so we are pointed out uh, where is the difference, and uh, I think. Well, I tried to help uh, Andre on that um, uh, for the FPGA stuff. It's up to him to uh, to answer better uh, for that. But I think that uh, we are more and more close uh, to the goal. Uh, well, that's and uh, for my side, I tried to uh, work on the on the filtering on the FPGA, um, not using the polyphase filter, which is uh, very uh, uh, design consuming, where well, a lot of cell. So I have some fear on that and it works now pretty good. So it's just an advance uh, when uh, the output of the encoder will be okay, then we have a good filtering and it, it could be, uh, uh, he's your to integrate. Back to you. Thank you so much. That's uh, fantastic. Okay, I think uh, probably the best person to talk next would be Swato. Tell us uh, what's going on. Yeah, so if 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 is, so he's saying try to help, but you know he did most of the work. Um, so yeah, there is the difference. I th so I think the difference is. Um, so the, one of the differences, right, um, is the um, like the block, the flow diagram has the header, the baseband header, um, and it uses like a, an older GNU, ver, a GNU radio version, but it, the, the, yeah, the key thing is the header that messes up the comparison. So I, I, I'm working on make the, making the environment like the, the repository, like the test work with the newer GNU ver, radio version and uh, you're removing the baseband header. So ideally, um, I think they do match. Like I remember I, I got to a point where they matched like the, the results that Everest found. Um, so that is one thing. The other thing is um, I, I, it's Leonard, Eldia, Le Leonard, right? Yes. I'm terrible with names, but <laughs> LD, 
Um, so he, so it, we, I, I was was speaking with him um, this weekend. So he gave a good idea to, like, so I tested Everest's uh, C function, um, not C function, the, like the program, you know, the executable that we use to send data, uh, and they basically send a ramp, sent a ramp, and I looked at the Vados ILA, and you know, NDNS is correct, and I can see you know zero 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 one two and so on which means we can send a, a custom data. So what Leonard was saying, you know, can we make this in stages? So if, so if I fix the flow diagram, uh, we have, I think it's worse, it, it's better working backwards. So the last thing is the physical airframer. So if say, okay, if suppose we have an input of zeros, at the you know beginning of the flow, we take the physical airframer input that we can radio generates and send that on Pluto and see if that works. And then we, you know if it doesn't, then it, it's you know the physical airframer has some issue. So if if it does work, then we take a step back and include the constellation mapper, and then you know then beat interleaver. Well, beat interleaver. You know, bit interleaver doesn't exist in the QPSK. Yeah, it essentially, move backwards using new rate. I, I think that's the most. Um, uh, there's probably a word for this, like the most. Uh, I don't know. Pragmatic. Yeah, yeah. Like instead of hoping that everything just works because you know I guessed what the error is, it, we're you know we're slice and you know divide and conquer okay yeah that sounds reasonable yeah so i i want so i'm focusing on getting the the, the repository in a state that you know we can get to the uh, divide and conquer phase um i think that the, the the most for the most part is done um I, th I think i can complete in the following days wow okay that'd be great that sounds like a lot of really good work. Is there anything that you need or that anything, anything additional um, to, in order to get this done? Or are you pretty much on track and just need time? Yeah, just time. Um, and I'm going to annoy Everest again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry in advance. <laughs> I mean, no, if we have, have like a similar setup where I can see uh, if the if I receive all zeros in the the decoder, you know, then I wouldn't need to annoy him. But um, I, I I don't know how hard it it, it is to get that in, in the lab. Honestly. No, so. yeah, no, yeah. I think I I remember you you mentioned this in Slack that all zeros is, you know, the, your assumption about all zeros is not exactly what came out of the the header. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, I think this is this is an under we understand the the problem. This is sort of like a test bench, sort of, and yeah, yeah, it, and we just need to get things jived up. The assumptions are not quite exactly the same yet, but they will be. Yeah, but I, I think we have all the tools, as in yes. we can send data. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think we have everything we need. Yeah, and and now are are oriented, and it's a it's a really good good set of progress i think it's uh we're on the right track yeah yeah um, cool and that, and that is it for me really okay yeah that's wonderful thank you um Thanks. Thanks. all right so i'll i'll go next i'll tell you about something completely different let's see i'm going to attempt to share the screen advanced work here Okay, so you should be seeing like a slideshow. I can't tell um, from, from where I'm at if I can. Somebody nod or give me a thumbs up. I can see you. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so it should say FPGA stand up 29 March, blah, blah, blah. Is that what you're seeing? Yep. Oh, good. Okay, so, okay, so we are our MATLAB startup. The MATLAB or MathWorks is the company. And we applied for and we were able to get into their so-called startup program, which is fantastic. This is a really great 
thing that they do. Now they're aimed at more commercial uh, startups. Um, so as we've kind of explained before, there isn't really a MATLAB license for nonprofits like us. Uh, the home license, which we've been using up to this point, specifically excludes research, which is what we do. Um, but it's a, a great thing. So if you don't have a home license, it's only $150 for MATLAB and Simulink, and you get a wide variety, not all, but you can have access to a heavily discounted wide variety of toolboxes. Now, what the home license does not include is things like HDL Coder and LTE things. So what we did is we applied for and got it. Um, so we get all the toolboxes, and we also get 40 hours of training credits uh, for a year. Uh, lots of people helped convince MATLAB that they should take a chance on us and do a sort of a pilot uh, with a nonprofit. So we've got another 11 months or so to make the fullest use possible of this program. And we're focusing on HDL coder or hardware description language coder. It's a toolbox. It, what it does is it takes MATLAB code, it converts it to HDL, and it handles uh, conversion to fixed point and then performs a ver verification validation and simulation and synthesis, but it, it relies on tools that you already have. So the simulation and synthesis tools are things like Model Sim, Vivado, or Cadence, or anything like that. So it it doesn't do it in-house, uh, but sets up and uses and leverages the like Vivado for us. And it can also program a hardware target using Vivado, and, and it could do FPGA in the loop, along with two other types of test. Um, there's an example. Here's the here's the link for the example that we've started out with. And here's the notes. So this is the HDL coder hello world. It's code generation of a, of a um, symmetric uh, finite infinite, infinite response filter. So it sets up a filter, and then what you do is you generate that that filter is HDL. So I. I read the, through the code and here's the filter it's actually doing. Uh, so you can see it really is a symmetric FIR filter. That's that's the one. Um, and what it does is you set up the algorithm and you set up a test bench in, with two MATLAB scripts. So these are two separate MATLAB scripts, .m files. And that's how you feed the HDL coder toolbox. Um, Here's notes about how you configure what's called a workflow advisor, which is a, a really neat and so far as I can tell, well done uh, workflow uh, assistant that walks you through the process of setting up your, your MATLAB code in order to do things like synthesize, simulate, verify, validate, and, and then even clean up. Uh, so it's all done in temporary folders. It doesn't mess up your MATLAB script. So if you're using your MATLAB as a golden reference or you're using it in order to generate uh, some sort of documentation or you just don't want it messed up, then it stays fine. You do all of this in another directory. And here's the result. So here's what happened uh, yesterday. Um, it is a little bit weird to see Vivado in a MATLAB command window. <laughs> but that's what you end up getting. So MATLAB is essentially commanding Vivado to do stuff for it. And you can see in the upper window, um, essentially the, the sort of the upper center window, you can actually see the generated HDL. And it is recognizable, relatively human readable HDL. I was really kind of stunned at how complicated this FIR filter it was in HDL. There's an awful lot of you know, manipulation and handling of um, the the filter coefficients for this filter. And thinking back, like in my professional career, I've never really had to handle this sort of stuff before. It was always DSP that was already, you know, lots of not a whole lot of filter coefficients. Other people on the team did that. So, so I was like, wow, okay, no wonder they had such a hard time at work. Uh, so my empathy level has gone up for, for dealing with this. Um, and when I've done IQ gain phase correction algorithms in the past, I've had to deal with this where, where you have to do, you know, carefully manage your fixed point and all. So anyway, it did it. It, it, it came across, it got tested. It, it heavily relies on your implementation of a MATLAB test bench in order to infer all of the correct 
uh, variable names, variable sizes, variable types. So this, this toolbox forces you to write a test bench from the get-go. That's how it works. And it's pretty clear from the example and the documentation that you can't just simply write some IP and have it turned into HDL unless you want to go by hand and do a whole bunch of stuff in the configuration that a test bench would provide for you. So that's the first kind of heads up that I have. OK, so you can see that it's generating a FPGA programming file. And then, you know, so we have the ZCU 106 connected to Karapi. All of this is on Karapi. And it failed. And it failed in kind of now like, OK, we sort of kind of expected this. The hardware server right now is connected to the Pluto. And even though I started up another uh, hardware server, uh, it, it doesn't really know it's not smart enough to just kind of have ESP and figure out what I want as a programmer. So that's where it stopped. But you can see it made it all the way to the bitstream. It started attempting to load the bitstream onto the hardware target that I had specified as the, the ZCU 106 chip. Um, so the problem boiled down to, I think the Pluto is still con is connected up to Karapi and as well it should be, because that's where we're getting lots of work done. Um, and it's just now a question of like figuring out how to use the hardware server or maybe moving all of this to, to a third uh, virtual machine. Um, you know, so that's just my fault. I, I haven't ever had to deal with two targets connected up to the same hardware server or the same version of Avado before. I expect it's a solve problem. I'll go educate myself. And there's also a lot of reports generated from HDL coder that's really pretty useful. Um, I say that the process was painless, but I was expecting it to be a case of you have to construct your MATLAB code correctly for this toolbox to work. You cannot just throw a MATLAB script at it and it magically convert it into HDL. And I've already had a phone call with MATLAB about this exact issue and they were relieved. It was relieved to hear that we understood that it wasn't magic. This is a, a very complex tool that gives you a tremendous amount of traction on HDL that allows people that don't know Verilog or VHDL to participate in FPGA and ASIC design, but you have to set up your MATLAB code correctly. So in other words, we already knew this, but we've just gotten a tremendous amount of confirmation, not just from humans at MathWorks over the, on the phone, but also from walking through one of the more complicated examples that they have. The, the toolbox comes with a suite of examples. And, you know, I think probably working through a few more of them before we attempt to turn the M17 code, because uh, that's the first real target that we're going to do, is uh, take the M17, which is our uplink protocol, um, to turn that into HDL. And we'll be able to compare it against some human written uh, HDL code on the pink uh, FPGA board from uh, WX90, who's who's done a tremendous amount of work here. So having a two implementations on FPGA for our uplink is a good thing. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, and that should go back to our. Okay, yes. All right, let's see who else do we have here. Oh, hey, it's uh, uh, Rick Hambly. Hey, do you want to uh, take the floor and tell us what's going on? Yeah, sure. There we are. <clears throat> I'll move the mic. Um, this is a great interest to me because you're hitting on two subjects that are giving me a great deal of trouble right now. I have a project that I'm trying to do. And this is a mock-up of the project, a Pluto with an antenna and a bias T and a battery pack on the back. And it receives signals from satellites sitting here in the basement with no spike. It has its own FPGA uh, code in it, and not the Pluto code that came with it. And I have a couple of these. And the two, one project that I was supposed to do was to take the Pluto board and modify it 
that is to say, design a new Pluto board, to put in the Pluto case that has everything a Pluto board has, plus some other circuitry relating to the battery pack, charging and regulation and put it all inside a Pluto case and have a Pluto on steroids that can at least receive satellite signals. That's what this one's designed to do, but also possibly transmit them on a handheld device uh, with eight hours of battery uh, capability. And that was a great project built that you can't buy the uh, sync processors that are inside the Pluto or any sync processors anywhere in that whole suite of processors, 70, 20, 30, 40, whatever they are. You can't buy any of them. They're not in production. So we called what was then Xilinx. I noticed my stock portfolio, Xilinx has disappeared. They've been purchased by AMD to the future of Xilinx. But in any case, called them up and they said, oh, well, why don't you just go to this other series and everything will be fine. And we said, oh my dear Lord, we're going from 20, $30 parts to hundred to a thousand dollar parts. And this whole product is not going to make sense at that point. So uh, that, that's one thing that I have in common with what you're doing. Another thing is Matt Lab. Took Matt Lab for my little one man company. And I finally am throwing in the towel and giving up. Uh, I did not renew my subscription to Simulate this year, although I still could. Um, and I renewed MATLAB because I'm still using it. But what I'm doing now um, is I've replaced, I, I'm rewriting some of the MATLAB M scripts that I've used in GPS 24-7 uh, workbench here, where I have a lot of equipment set up and I collect the data and produce PDF reports with MATLAB. Very nice, but I've discovered that if I want to do more with that data, I need to buy more modules. And they're all $1,000 and up per module, no matter how small an increase in my desire to process data and produce better reports. I'm, and I've made very good progress now on the world of machine learning as, as uh, implemented by open source modules like uh, Panda and, and Python and NumPy and Scilearn uh, and, and uh, Map, uh, you know, uh, Map plot, whatever it's called. Um, and, and I've done a pretty good job of that. Unfortunately, that whole world, which is new to me, and I'm very excited about it because I can do a lot of things. Pretty much almost everything I can do in that lab, I can do there. I'm finding the open source world to be a little bit tricky. Uh, what do I mean by that? MATLAB's modules, when you buy them, are all consistent one with the other. Uh, they all play together really well. So when I go in and look at Python and then the syntax of these other modules to do the same thing, the syntax changes. Uh, it, it's probably typical of the open source world where all these modules produced by all these different people do complementary things, but in, in a, they're enough different to be confusing sometimes. Nonetheless, it's worth it, I think, to go to the open source world and get my future uh, data analysis in that world. Unfortunately, the one thing that that world doesn't have, I think, is the module that you're looking at uh, to get you from those models back into an FPGA. However, 
having taken the the Verilog course and and then studying VHDL independently, uh, the MSAT Verilog course. You might recall that course it was very well done. Uh, and I think. Uh, in, in any case, I, having had a background in bit slice arrays from the good old days before there were FPGAs, I have no problem understanding the Verilog and VHDL codes. So I'm planning on just sticking with that and not trying to short circuit it. With I can't afford, in any case, the math modules that you're talking about trying to use. Yeah, they are shockingly expensive um for those of you that don't know the yeah, I, the quote for hdl coder um and and the things that are and as uh i think that uh that rick will probably agree with me um it isn't always it is it, it's never just one module right it's always that module and then you need about three others because there's dependencies there's an awful lot of them. There's nearly a hundred of these toolboxes. Uh, so the thing that we were most interested in, in trying out and using actually requires uh, three or four others. So when you when you get them all together and you go get a quote to just wander in and you say, okay, we want to do this say commercially, then it ends up being nearly thirteen thousand um, dollars, and that that is actually a low end. That's that's th it's thirteen thousand dollars in addition to to you buying it as a commercial customer. So you can see how the home license, um, which is an effort that I was involved in trying to make happen, um, you know, for 150 bucks, you can get the MATLAB license, but they won't give you HDL coder. The reason that they don't give you HDL coder is because of the amount of customer support that has been required, because it's complicated. So those yeah. of us that are, that are in open source, that also are in FPGAs, that would be able to use this and would be able to use it correctly, um, we get kind of tossed out with the bathwater because we're such a small community, really. Um, so hopefully with this particular experience, we may be able to make a, a, a case that things like HDL coders should be 40 bucks for people that are not going to use it commercially, that are not going to use it in an academic sense, that are not going to use it for R&D. You know, okay, fine. At, at least that's a step forward because those are the people that are backbone of open source work. And yes, it you know it it gives you uh, you know just a, a a boost, right? So so it allows you some some tremendous leverage from MATLAB to HDL coder. That but like for people like you or me or Everest or Swato or any of the people um, working on this can if they if you can write in HDL natively uh, and or v, you know HDL of any type, VHDL or Verilog, that's still going to be the best way forward. The code that's produced is is actually readable and good, um, but I think that we'll see over time whether or not it's as good as the code that's being produced. Uh, so part of part of the reason for doing this is to see, okay, take this proprietary tool, use it, and then compare it to an open source implementation of of say M17 uplink protocol, and like, okay, let's see, can you do as good with it? And if you can do as good, then Hey, Octave, the open source MATLAB, what, how far are you from being able to provide this level of service to the open source community? So yes, we are after a particular goal uh, to, to provide particular open source FPGA work and a working system at microwave for amateur radio satellite. Yes, we, will, we are proceeding and marching towards that goal. But we are also looking at improving open source tool flow and the only way that we can really get to know where we need to be is by, you know, bravely, <laughs> and some would say, somewhat stupidly blundering into things like uh, this and, and just using the stuff that is used in industry and going and seeing what we can achieve with it so that we have some experience with what is what's on the proprietary side, because that is a standard that open source tools should aspire to deliver. And you brought up something very, very important. There is a huge inconsistency in not just user experience, but also user interface and configuration and quality and completeness across open source. So the tools for, for machine learning uh, are exceptionally good in open source. It's an excellent place to, to, to leverage um, 
you're not wrong there. Uh, but yeah, you will see some inconsistency because each uh, there, there's 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 not there, there's different uh, enforcement, so to say, so to speak. Of uh, you know, there's not the same desire for consistency or need for it from the open source community. Um, being all you know, a lot of cases it's it's grassroots or built from the bottom up. Um, so thank you so much for sharing and and talking. You've, you've raised a number of of intersecting issues here. Um, so back to you for a final. Um, the one other comment I have is uh, that the worst doing FPGA work are software people. Uh, the the majority of the software engineers I know don't understand that this is not a microprocessor. Uh, it, the, some of the best uh, programmers are people uh, with primarily hardware expertise who can understand that this isn't a sequential machine with some interrupts and things. This, this is really a hardware matrix that you can do hardware things with. And yes, uh, <clears throat> so if you can design that FIR or IIR filter in hardware with, with old uh, 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 LSTTL chips, then you can probably program an FPGA really, really well. Uh, but if you think you're going to do it with C code, and yes, the modules translate C code into FPGA, you're not going to get a, a particularly good answer. And I'm not sure, I'm, I don't know anything about MATLAB's transition of MAT, uh, M code into FPGA code, but M code looks an awful lot like straight programming to me. So I have my doubts as to how good this will really be. Uh, but I, I, I think it would be wonderful if we had a really new and understood uh, HDL, uh, how to program HDL correctly. Uh, but that's harder to do than you might think. Yeah, nothing. It's uh, really hard to get people to say, I'm going to give up my entire life and dedicate it to this thing because it really does take that kind of dedication. No, it does. Things worth doing are rarely easy. They require an awful lot of seat time, and that's uh, going to continue to be true no matter how hard we try to make it easy and accessible. And you know, that's uh, we just have to do our our best. Um, but so far, the HDL coder has exceeded my expectations, which are not very high. Uh, really, I was I was expecting it to be. Um, more like HLS, uh, the so high level synthesis from Vivado. I was expecting it to be more like that. Uh, it's better. Uh, so I That's think there cool. is a better match between uh, properly written, and that needs to be emphasized, properly written MATLAB script. Uh, there's a better match between the MATLAB and its approach as matrix you know, matrix laboratory or matrix manipulation. This seems to be a better match for this type of conversion than, than just C. Um, which yes, you can write C code and make it work well in HLS. I've seen it done before, but it's it requires a, a I think more effort on the part of the programmer. So yeah. we'll see. And the 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 task here is to document it fully and and to you know to to push forward and to improve open source tool flow, because if they're doing this in MATLAB, this could be done open source. And you know we see a growing FPGA open source. Uh, community and they have a, a lot of impediments and roadblocks and difficulty challenges. Um, so any sort of overall kind of like a tool flow innovation or an awareness of what's what's possible. And you know, if if we see some design patterns that really should be honored, then yeah, we're, we'll we'll do our best to kind of raise that up as a as something for the open source community to to tackle. So that's part of the, the mission uh, at ORI. It's part of what we're doing. In the meantime, though, yeah. uh, if we can use this tool to make some really good HDL that helps us with our uplink, uh, then right on. <laughs> we'll keep doing oh, yeah. it. <laughs>
I, I wish I could have some hardware here to play with, but I'd need I'd need some partner someplace. I've got no no one to talk to about this stuff. No, that's a shame. Well, I mean, uh, if you want to work on open source amateur radio satellite stuff, then the remote labs is uh, there for you to use. So yeah, I'm, I'm tempted. <laughs> we'll very good. Hey, very good. That's all we need to hear. All right, cool. All right. Any other comments, uh, questions or um, uh, any resources that anybody needs or any roadblocks that anybody has before we close the meeting for today? All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll keep it up and we'll be back here next week. Uh, please uh, check in on Slack to see all the really cool stuff. Uh, the bit, the the mismatch that was discussed earlier between Everest and Swato. There's a really good um, image of the problem. You can see that everything works great. The bits are matching up to a point, and then they kind of go awry. Uh, there's an excellent image in uh, FPGA channel on Slack. And uh, okay, yeah. Until next week. See you, everybody. <laughs>